here is the um, canvas page or your view of the canvas page. And so um, the problems we're going to be doing the second half of the of the class are here under workshop problems. And you don't have to print them. You can download them onto your computer or tablet or your phone or whatever it is you're using. Um, and so we're going to be going over these problems in the second half, okay? And what I'd like you to do with them is, I mean, we're going to work on them together. we will put everyone into groups. Then you can work on them in your groups and you can work on them however you like. You can assign one person to each problem or you can do them together. However, each of your groups wants to work that kind of stuff out. Um, and then we'll all come back and we'll sort of uh, go over the ones that people had uh, trouble with. And then I'd kind of like you to um, submit them um, into Canvas as an assignment. You have a week to, to submit it. So if you don't get everything done tonight, no worries. Um, you, you got a whole week uh, to submit that. And again, you don't have to print this out. Um, what you can do is just just write out the answers. I know what the questions are. I mean, I wrote them and they're right there. So you don't have to reprint the um, the problems. What I do want you to show though, is your oh, work. So if you, let's say um, some of these problems, it asks you to convert something to something else. And you just give me the final answer and that's it. And you don't show me how you got there. I can't give you full credit for that because I don't know how you did that. Maybe you asked somebody what the answer was and you got it that way. That's really not the best way to learn things I've found. So if you could show your work in them, even if you get the wrong answer, I don't really care. Um, if you show me that you know how to do the problem, um, that's really the key to that. Um, as far as the first part goes, if you want to um, have the have the slides and, and follow along, or you want to print them out and, and make notes on them, they're right under there under, under chapter one. It's the very first link in chapter one, and these are all the slides in there. Okay, you can you can download that um, as well and do with them as you wish. Okay. So what I was going to do is basically, um, and we may change this as the, the class goes along. I know the previous 410 classes, uh, the previous instructor would um, record the lectures and then post them. Um, we can do that if it turns out that that's something you want to do. I'll, I'll probably have a, I'll put a, a poll um, in, the, in, the, in the Zoom class uh, next week to see if that's the way you'd like to do it. I'll also put a poll in uh, to determine what's the best day um, for me to have um, office hours for people. It sounds like from what I've, from talking to you separately in your separate uh, groups last week, that nights are better than days. So now I guess it's just a matter of trying to figure out which day um, is best at precisely what time. So we'll, we'll do that uh, next week as well, okay? So again, any, any questions before I get droning on with, uh, with the, the lesson in the first half? Yes, Professor. Okay, yes. Um, I still don't have access to any of that on Canvas since I'm on oh, the Oh, right, you're still on the list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can't like, see any of the problems unless you share your screen so what should i do oh, i can um put a i can put it in the uh, chat thank you okay i will do that so we're gonna have like a little break before the before the um the, the workshop part i figure everyone can't just sit for two hours you know they'll just go crazy so we'll have like a little uh 10 minute break i'll put it in the chat then and you can look at them at that point okay Thank you so much. No problem, Seth. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's get going. Can you turn on the computer? Oh, and... Okay. All right. Can everyone stop me? Okay. So you should. Now everyone can see the. Uh, 
for the single screen. Let me see. Oh yeah. All right. Cool. All right. So a lot of this will be sort of similar to what we talked about during the lab class last week, because you know I was making such a big deal about sig figs and measurements and all that sort of thing. So we're just sort of doing a. Uh, this will just be a quick review for everybody. Um, but why you're taking chemistry, I don't know. But I mean, what are the things I like to say about about uh, chemistry? And why it's my fight, why it's my favorite um, particular discipline, is that if physics is the study of forces and, and um, biology is the study of life and it is well chemistry is the study of matter and what's matter well that's everything so i mean by studying chemistry you're basically studying everything and you can see that it's you know everything sort of flows out of there so basically anybody studying any kind of science is taken i mean chemistry is just essential really to understand it and so we kind of like to say we're more or less in the middle um, where, and you're going to learn some of these things uh, in this class. You're going to learn some, some, okay. some biochemistry. We're going to do a little bit of chemical physics, not very much, but a little bit. And a lot of you are in the um, uh, field of medicine and biology. And so, you know, hopefully it will, it'll, it'll become more and more obvious why why we're taking the class and, and the stuff we're going to learn from it so you know you can see it everywhere um you look through a piece of glass you've got a piece of metal you've got you know the water you're drinking has been treated with with chemicals you, you deal with anytime you do any baking or cooking you're doing chemistry and so one of the things I sort of want people to be aware of, and I think it really helps, what I try and do in, in the class is take things that you see every day and try to explain that in a chemical way. And hopefully you'll start doing that yourself. You'll see something and thought, why does that, like, you know, um, like when you bleach something and it turns white, well, why does that do that? Why do we use uh, bleach to, to clean our clothes? How come? You know, little things like that. You know, what does baking powder do? Why does it, you know, make things rise? Um, that's the sort of thing we'll be we'll be learning about, and that you should be sort of looking at. And I'd like you to come into the class with questions about that. That'd be great. Um, Can you check because then you'll get to see how dumb I am when I won't be able to explain it. But it was nice. Okay, so let's whoever whoever isn't muted, could you just hit the hit the the mute are getting some bleed through. Thanks. All right, so why quantities and measurements are so important? Well, for you know those of you who are, who are um, gonna be in, in, in the medical field, that's pretty important, right? I mean, medications have to be exactly measured. And of course, we learned last week that like, there's no such thing as an exact measurement, but we can get pretty precise. And so it's really, really important. Um, that not only when we're measuring something, that we measure something precisely and accurately, but then when we've measured something, then when it's time to actually like say deliver a medication, we have to do a calculation based on the patient's body weight or something like that, right? So if we've measured our dose of drug precisely, and we have measured the patient's mass precisely, that when we do the calculations to give that um, dose of drug that we keep that precision. We don't want to lose any any of the precision because we've taken so much time to keep it. So we're constantly measuring things. You know, something as important as you know injecting drugs into a patient or something you know just like baking. Um, we need to keep track of these sort of things. So let me I need to move. Okay. All right. So when chemists get together and we talk at parties, we like to describe matter into two general categories. So there's two kind of properties that stuff has. One is physical, the other is chemical. So physical properties are basically something you would use in general to just describe something that you would see like how big is it? What shape is it? Um, what color is it? Um, what mass is it? 
What can anyone tell me what the diff? Why do we always say mass? Why don't we say weight? What's the difference between mass and weight? Can someone tell me? Yep, Dylan says because weight includes gravity. That's right. Um, because if someone were to shoot you with a gun in space um, where a thing is weightless, uh, you're still going to get hit with a bullet and have all the physical manifestations of that. Because even if the bullet is weightless, it is not massless. And so, yeah, mass depends on the weight. So even uh, weighing something in one part of the world, like weighing something on the top of Mount Everest, it's going to have a different weight than it does at Death Valley. And why? Because the gravity is slightly differently. It's slightly differently. It's slightly different from one place and another. And so we have to take that into consideration. And so we measure mass and not weight. Okay, so what's a chemical property? Well, basically chemical properties is, is describes how something is going to react. Um, what's its chemical structure? What's its composition? Um, what are the, what are the um, elements in it and how are they bound together? So examples would be um, if you have like a piece of uh, uh, silverware, like actual silverware made from silver, you know that they, they tarnish over time. That is a chemical property of the silver because it is oxidized um, over time with the oxygen in the atmosphere. And when you polish it, when you clean it, you are actually doing a reduction reaction. And we'll learn about that a little later. Basically, oxidation is taking away of electrons and reduction is giving those electrons back. When you digest food, you're taking advantage of the chemical properties um, in that food, you're going to be breaking it down and getting energy out of it. When you burn natural gas, you get carbon dioxide and you get water. Certain things are more flammable than others. Certain things aren't flammable at all. Certain um, um, components are more flammable at higher temperatures. And so flammability is a chemical property or when something rusts, that is also oxidation, just like silver um, tarnishing. Some elements um, uh, rust or oxidize very, very quickly. Iron is one that um, oxidizes very readily. And so that's why stainless steel basically uh, was invented to, to keep um, the iron in the steel from oxidizing quite so quickly. So resistance to oxidation is also a chemical property. And it doesn't have anything to do with its, its mass, its color, its size, anything like that. It is basic, it is the, it's the uh, uh, property of the actual chemical bonds inside that particular uh, matter. So we can break down matter into basically two things. It's either the same all the way through the sample. Um, and it can either be broken down into simpler elements or it can't. So any sample that has like the same chemical and physical properties all the way throughout is, we just call that a substance, right? So oxygen is a substance. Um, air is also a substance, even though it's more complicated. What's the difference? Well, an element, you cannot break it down into smaller um, into simpler components. Like, like it says here, an, an aluminum can. It's basically, you can't break that down into smaller pieces than an atom of aluminum. That's as small as it gets. But if it's a compound, you can chemically break that down into simpler um, elements. Water is the example here. That's a compound because it has two elements in it, hydrogen and oxygen. Um, carbon dioxide, you can break that down into carbon and oxygen. But oxygen, also a compound, because you can break it down into two atoms of oxygen. 
a single atom of oxygen, you can't really break that down into, any, in, into anything else. But we'll find out that some elements are more comfortable existing as compounds. Um, and most of them are gases, interestingly. And we'll learn, we'll learn, when we get to the periodic table, we'll learn that a lot of compounds just prefer, like oxygen and nitrogen, uh, prefer to be bound with another atom. When we talk about how uh, atoms share electrons, we'll get more in, into that. Now, the difference between a substance and a mixture is that a, a mixture, it basically is just more than one substance mixed together. So, and then again, because chemists just love breaking things into more and more complex uh, uh, compounds, um, we break those into two different uh, two different parts as well. So a mixture, there's two different types generally of, of mixtures. One is we can basically easily pull the pieces apart. Like if you have you mix oil and water together, and you shake it up and you see that they mix together. Well, if you leave it for a while. The oil floats to the top because it's less dense and the water sinks to the bottom because it's more dense. They separate by themselves. Um, if you have like, if anyone's been unfortunate enough to be gifted a fruitcake at Christmas, um, you can see all the stuff that's in there, right? You can easily pick out the, this is a fig, you know, this is a, this is a big nut. You can pick the pieces out. Um, that's called a heterogeneous mixture. Hetero meaning different. So you can see the differences, but some mixtures, the components are so intimately combined that you can't easily separate them. You can separate them, but it's not easy. Like um, salt water, for instance, salt water, you look at, a, at the salt water and you can't see that there's more than one thing in there, although there's hundreds of, of different things in there. But if you just look at it, you shake it up and it's, it doesn't, it doesn't separate, but there's salts in there, there's minerals in there, there's, there's dissolved gases in there, there's a ton of stuff in there, but you can't see them, and it's not quite as easy to separate them. And we call that, so that kind of mixture, we say it has a consistent composition. In other words, if I took this glass of water, and I took a little bit from the top, and I took a little bit from the bottom, and I took a little bit from the middle, they should all be exactly the same. I mean, chemically, they're exactly the same. It's just water in there and, you know, some other like small amount of minerals or whatever. Um, but it all looks identical. So we call that a homogenous mixture. Homo meaning same. So it looks the same. Hetero looking different. Homo meaning same. So it's, we say it's a homogenous uh, mixture. And if you dissolve something, if you have a mixture with something dissolved in something else, that has a special name, we call that a solution. And interestingly enough, we not all solutions are solids dissolved in liquids. Some mixtures like air is a solution of gases dissolved in other gases. What are all the gases in air dissolved in? What do you think is the, so if we say that's the main component of a mixture is the solvent and the other things that are dissolved in it are solutes. What do you think the solvent is in air? Not oxygen. Carbon? Nope. What's the most abundant? Nitrogen, there you go. Yeah, nitrogen is about 78% of the, of the air you breathe. And so we, we consider air to be a solution of gases dissolved in nitrogen, basically because it's the most abundant gas. Yeah, good job. So when we're classifying matter, um, we have a substance. Is there only one thing in the substance? Yes. Well, either it's a compound or an element. Compound, you can break down. Element, you can't. Is there more than one thing present? Uh, is there only one? I'm sorry, is there only one thing present? Well, no, there's a bunch of different things present. Well, then you got a mixture and either you can easily separate them or you can like see the differences and that's, that's a heterogeneous mixture or it's a solution, it's a homogeneous mixture. So now we're gonna get on to measurements. We covered, like I said, we covered a lot of this um, last week. 
So if a, say you're making coffee in the morning, something I do every morning. <laughs> so, it, you know, you'll get, basically, you know, if you've been making coffee long enough, you can basically do it when you're asleep because basically you are. And so, you know, you, you use a certain amount of coffee, use a certain amount of water. You're measuring these things. Um, generally, you know, if you're filling up the, the, the coffee pot, you're looking at the water going up or you're actually, or in the case with mine's broken, so you gotta actually measure it with a, with a, with a measuring cup. Um, you're doing measuring. When you go to a doctor's office, you're gonna get some measurements done on you. Your temperature is gonna get measured, your height, weight, blood pressure, all those things are measurements too. So the thing you need to remember about measurements is you have to have a quantity, meaning a number and a unit. So I'm gonna come down on, on that a lot of times. People are gonna to forget to include units. And it's so important because, um, you know, if a doctor asks, you know, what's the, what is the, um, weight of a patient and you went 14 and didn't mention that you were using stone rather than pounds or, 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 or kilograms, they'd be very confused. They really wouldn't know what, I mean, they wouldn't know what to make of that. So you have to have a unit in any measurement because without it, it's just a number and a number is pretty meaningless without, without um, a unit. So chemists always, measure the properties of matter and express those as quantities. A quantity, how much of something, and a unit telling you what that scale of measurement is. And the example given here, you know, you ask a smart ass friend how, you know, how far she has to walk to class and she goes 12, you know, you don't know what that means, right? So you have to have a number and you have to have a unit in order to get, uh, to express a quantity of something. So hopefully everyone's familiar with um, scientific notation because we're good to be using that um, a lot in class. And the reason why scientific notation is so helpful, um, sometimes you have to write really big or really small numbers and you don't want to have to use, you know, 23 zeros to show how big a number is, or, you know, 19 zeros after the decimal point to show how small some sort of number is. Basically, we use this to show us how much of something uh, we have, and then exactly um, how big or how small that amount actually is. So if I said I had 2.36 um, grams of something, that would be very easy to write, 2.36 grams, that's fine. But what if I had 236 billion grams and I didn't want to you know, write all those zeros? I would still use the 2.36 is what we call the coefficient. That is where the um, significant digits are so important because it's only significant digits that show up um, in the coefficient here. We only use significant digits. So if I had 236 billion grams of something, I would still use my 2.36, but then I would multiply it by a factor of 10 to show you how big that number is. So a billion is a thousand is three, a million is 10 to the sixth, and, um, and a billion is 10 to the ninth. So 2.36 times 10 to the ninth grams. And that's much easier than you know uh, writing all those zeros out. People make mistakes counting those zero. I know I do all the time, you know, trying to count getting the right number of zeros. So sometimes it's actually easier. Uh, to use the coefficient. So that's for large numbers. For really, really tiny numbers, and we'll also be using, we'll probably be using more really small numbers than really large numbers, um, like um, certain uh, drugs being given uh, to patients, or you know, when you're calculating the amount of poison, what's the lethal dose of something. Those are usually really, really small um, amounts. 
we're talking, you know, millionths of a gram or sometimes even billionths of a gram. So using my 2.36 again, if I had 2.36 nanograms of something, anyone know what nano means? How big is nano? One billionth? That's right, it's a billionth. So it's one billionth of a gram. And so instead of 10 to the ninth, it'd be 10 to the minus nine because it shows you that it goes nine zeros in the other direction. It goes nine zeros past the decimal point to the, to the right rather than uh, nine decimals to the left. So that would be 2.36 times 10 to the minus nine grams. And it helps to, to do this when we're breaking down, um, sometimes when we're doing calculations and um, we've got all these different units. We got you know, kilograms and grams and nanograms, you know, femtograms or, or megagrams or whatever it is. And we, and we need to do a calculation with them. It's good to get everything to the same base um, unit and then do our calculations. So we have to do that fairly frequently. So that's why um, um, scientific notation really helps uh, there as well. So these are some of the prefix. So, um, so million, that is 10 to the six. Anyone know what, the, um, what we use for million? We put, what's the prefix for million we use? It's a really good one. Starts with an M. M E. M E G. Oh man, no one knows Mega. Come on, Mega. There you go. Oh yeah, Rachel got it. Yeah, Mega. Um, so we don't really. We're not going to use that too much, but I, I don't know. It's 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 one of my favorite prefixes, and most of the metric system basically has exponents that deal with like ten to the third. So they'll have one for ten to the third. They'll have one for ten to the sixth. They'll have one for ten to the ninth. But there's generally not one for every single um, one. So one tenth is one times ten to the minus one. That is deci, if anyone's curious. And then uh, 10 to the second is centi, and then milli. Man, those really look bad. <laughs> um, so as you get smaller and smaller and smaller, the, the, the exponent goes negative. And it's basically just tells you how many zeros, uh, how many times you have to move the decimal. So 10 to the minus one, is 0.1, meaning if you move this decimal one place, then you get a whole number. Same with 10 to the minus six, this number here, meaning you have to move the decimal one, two, three, four, five, six, until you get to a whole number. So that's how you um, see whether it's a large number or a small number, whether it's a positive in scientific notation or whether it's negative. Okay, and most of the time we're gonna be using negative. So as I mentioned, most of the things that the chemists are gonna be measuring are gonna be kind of small because you don't need a lot of, a lot of um, uh, matter to do experiments and to measure things. So generally when we're dealing, especially in biochemistry, which is you know, my background, when we're, when we're buying um, stuff from you know, scientific companies, we're getting milligrams of things. Um, small, small amounts of, 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 of chemicals. So yeah, because we can go fairly quickly through this because we sort of dealt with this before, but the difference between precision and accuracy. So significant figures are all about precision. They tell you how um, precisely you measured something. And how precisely you measured something is basically how, how reproducible 
is it? If I use the same instrument to record the mass of something and I get exactly the same answer to four digits every single time, well, that's a very precise um, instrument and I'm using it properly because I'm getting the same uh, result every time. That tells me I'm getting precision. And the difference in precision is the difference in the instrument. Um, in the lab, we'll, we'll we'd be using things that can measure the mass to like uh, one millionth of a gram. Um, if you go to the grocery store and you're throwing something on that big, um, you're throwing some like, you know, a head of lettuce on one of those big spring uh, masses or, or balances, you're not going to get that kind of precision with that, right? You're luckily if it's within half a pound. So we'd be using more significant figures for something measured um, with a lab uh, scale than we would um, using something in the supermarket, more significant digits. So I'll just go through this briefly because I think everyone got this from last week. But anyway, how do you determine the number of significant figures? Because it's important when we're doing calculations. Anything that isn't a zero is automatically significant. So there you go. You can, those are automatically. You don't have to even think about them. If you have a long string of numbers, there's no zeros in there. Every, every one of them is, is significant. Any zero that's between non-zero numbers, that's also significant. And the way I like to think about it is um, if you're wondering like whether a number is significant or not, ask yourself, if you were counting, what would the next number be? So in, in other words, this number 408 here. So I've got the number 408. What's the next number? 409, right? So all three of those numbers must be significant. But if I gave you the, no, the number 410, what's the next number? 412. 412? 411. Oh, yeah. Is it? Unknown. 412. It should be 412, right? It could, be mean, four, it could be 420 if I was counting in tens, right? Oh, I thought, I thought, oh, I thought you were looking at the circle, like 408 to 410. Oh, I see. No, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah, so that's it. It's, it's ambiguous. It could be, the next number could be 411, but it could just as easily be 420 if I was counting by tens. So I could have been going 390, 400, 410, 420. The thing is you don't know. And so in 410, only these two numbers are significant. This zero is not significant because it's ambiguous. You don't know whether, you don't know what the next number is. And so what you can only say for sure is that the four and the one, those are both significant because they're not zero, but the zero isn't. Um, if you wanted to make it significant, what, what would we do if we wanted to make it significant? Add a decimal point after the zero. Bingo, exactly. So I would write 410, bing. That says that when I measured something, I measured it to the nearest one, not the nearest 10. And so the next number would be 411. So that tells somebody, um, if, you're, if you were following a recipe, for instance, and it said to add you know, 410 grams of flour to, to something. Well, if you put in a 411, that'd be okay. Um, but if it said add 410 period, that means you better add exactly 410 or you're gonna screw it up. But if it just had 410 without something, then eh, around 410 would be fine. So that's the that's the difference in, in the precision. Oop. So any zeros to the left of the first non-zero number aren't significant. So there's no non-zero numbers in here between. Eh, so there's no non-zero numbers in here until you get to a non-zero number. So it's just, all those are doing is telling you how big that number is. It's telling you that it's 3.2 times 10 to the minus one, minus two, minus three. Basically, all it's doing is telling you which one of these you're gonna use when you put it in, in scientific notation. So, I mean, it's helpful. 
it shows you how big or how small um, the number is. But that's all it does. It doesn't really give you any other indication of the actual quantity of something. So trailing zeros are, if have a number that's slightly different. So if trailing zeros are past a decimal, that means they're there for a reason. That means somebody measured something to within the nearest, not gram or not 10th of a gram or hundredth of a gram, but the nearest thousandth of a gram. And that did such a good job measuring, they want you to know it. So all those numbers are significant because they're past a decimal place. And we don't put things past a decimal place unless we actually need them. So that tells you they're significant. Same with this one. Even though we have now three or uh, two non-zero uh, digits past the decimal, those zeros are still significant. And again, it's because they measured this result to not a tenth or a hundredth or a thousandth, but the nearest 10,000 this time. So within 10,000th of a gram. And so that shows you that that number is precise and that all those numbers are significant. Now, trailing zeros before the decimal, as I showed you before, aren't significant. Because as we showed, this number 1,200 is ambiguous as to what the next number is. It could be 1,201 if we were counting by ones. On the other hand, it could be 1,210 if we were counting by tens, or it could be 1,300 if we're counting by hundreds. We don't know. And so if we want to tell somebody what the, what the significance of that number is, we need to put it into scientific notation, and that'll tell us that it either has two, three, or four significant numbers, or significant digits, or we can just put a decimal at the end. And that tells you that all the numbers before that, before that decimal are um, significant. And so on tests, this is a classic thing to look out for on tests because chemistry teachers are evil people by, by nature. Um, look for those decimals. Um, you probably aren't, if, unless you're like working in a lab, you may not be familiar with, with having a decimal at the, at the end of a number rather than the, you know, the end of a period or something. So we've slipped those in there um, to see if you've been paying attention. And so you'll get a, you know, uh, have, have a calculation to do where one of the numbers will be something like 3,110 decimal. And then if you do your calculations and you come back and, and you report your answer to only three significant digits, well, that's not right. And so you'd lose a point. And then, and then the dreaded sig fig will be written on your paper and crying will result and everything else. So be, uh, be on the lookout for that. Um, yeah, go ahead. What about the previous slide with uh, 140.00? So Mm -hmm. All of those numbers are significant figures. That's right. right. Okay. That's right. All of them. Yeah, because you only put zeros after a decimal if you if you have to. Um, there's no point in, in putting them there unless they're significant. So the difference between 140 decimal and 140.00 is that this quantity was measured to the nearest one. And this quantity was measured to the nearest hundredth. And there's a difference, right? I mean, um, this one is more precise. And this one, the, the 140 to the closest gram, that means it could be 140.2, it could be 140.3, 140.4. There could be a lot um, of differences there. This 140.00 can't be any of those. The only, the only um, additional mass it could have and still have that would be either 140.001, 2, 3, or 4. So much, much smaller difference. And that's why it's, those numbers are so much more significant. Yeah, good question. Now, exact numbers. Exact numbers sort of come up occasionally. Um, not a lot, but they do. Generally, when we're counting something, 
um, counting something is different than measuring something. Because as I mentioned before, or you probably know already, we can't get the exact mass of anything. We don't know. I mean, eventually there's going to be some sort of uncertainty at the, at the end of any measurement. Even if I measure something, let's say the 1.0000000 grams, someone can say, well, what's the next number? I don't know. And so, you know, you can't measure anything exactly. But when you're counting something, you can be exact, right? There is one of me, one. There's not approximately one or, you know, close to one or 1.0. No, there's just one. And that is an exact number. And an exact number has an unlimited number of significant figures, which sounds weird, right? Because we just say one dozen, for instance, is equal to 12. Well, 12 what? 12.0? 12 12.00? 12 no, it's actually 12.0 to infinity because it is exactly 12. It's not a little less than 12 or a little more than 12. It's exactly. So when we're doing calculations with something that has an exact number, we say that has an unlimited number of significant digits. We don't have to limit ourselves um, for accuracy because we can't get any more accurate than an exact number. There isn't anything more accurate than that. Some confer so, so some conversion factors, and we'll, we'll deal with a lot of conversion factors um, later tonight. Some are defined quantities and are exact, like one dozen equals exactly 12. Most of them aren't. Most of them are sort of uh, approximate, like one pound is equal to about 454 grams. Obviously, that's not exact, but it's close. It's really, really close. One really weird thing, and again, this is sort of something that um, evil chemistry teachers will throw in. It's just weird how this worked out, but one inch, so the, like the imperial measure of, of, or the English measure of one inch is exactly 2.54 centimeters, which is weird. It's not close to 2.454 centimeters. It is exactly that, and an infinite string of zeros. So if I have, um, if I'm doing this um, conversion, the number of significant digits is always going to be, however, my, the number of significant digits in the inches. If I have six significant digits measuring an inch, I'll have six significant digits in my um, uh, number of centimeters as well, even though I'm only using three digits to, to do the conversion, because for some bizarre reason, that is exact. Yes, Dylan? Wait, but isn't uh, inches and like centimeters are all measurements, right? So like, even if you're- No, no, it isn't. It's a unit. An oh, it's a unit. unit. Oh, oh, ah, oh, okay. Ah. okay. Yeah, so one inch is, is a me if I say something is an inch is, is a measurement, but if I'm saying an inch, is equal to something, that's, that's, that's a conversion factor. That's a unit. Yeah. Yeah, it, actually, it, it should, yeah, the example should say an inch. <laughs> it's exactly 2.54 centimeters. But again, yeah, that's, that's what that means. Good, good question. Yeah, sometimes I get, it's good to ask questions like this, because sometimes I, mean, I, I, I say things that like, well, I know what I mean. <laughs> but nobody else knows what I mean. So yeah, actually, that's a, probably a good, a good, um, we're good to change that slide to make that point better. Um, yes. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that if you're converting and you use the one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters and you're rounding to significant figures, no matter what else is in that conversion, would you have to round it to one significant figure because of that one, the one no, inch? No, good point. Um, so when you're doing the conversion, the conversion basically means we're, we're multiplying something. Let's, let's just do a quick one here. So if I have 3.2 inches um, and then I wanna convert that to centimeters. 
So what I, what I do is I multiply that by something, my conversion factor. And remember, conversion factor is always going to be equal to one. So whatever's on the top of the conversion factor, whatever on the bottom, have to be equal to each other. So I'm just multiplying, basically I'm multiplying this by one because all I'm doing is changing the unit. I am not changing the amount of anything. I'm not changing um, the size or my measurement. I'm not changing any of that. I'm just changing the unit. So I'm multiplying by one. So if I want centimeters at the end, I want to put centimeters on the top and I want to put inches on the bottom. And I know that one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. So I'll multiply my 3.2 by 2.54. My inches, I have inches on the top, I have inches on the bottom, they go away. My only unit that I have left over is centimeters, so they stay. And so 3.2 times 2.54 is 8.5. 128 centimeters. But I can't express that many significant digits, right? Because when I'm doing calculations like this, I have to reflect the precision of the measured quantities. The only measured quantity here is inches. That's the measured quantity. This is a conversion factor. And so how many significant digits should I have in my final answer? Two. Two, that's right. So instead of 8.128 centimeters, how many should I have? Two, so 8 point, just 8.1. 8.1, right. So those are the two. I look to my right and I see if it's five or greater, I round up. If it's four or less, I leave it alone. So 8.1 centimeters. So I can't lose or gain precision. I have to have the same amount of precision going in as I have coming out. But the thing to remember is if I had 3.21657 inches and I multiplied it by this conversion factor, my answer should have one, two, three, four, five, six significant digits in it because that's how much uh, significant um, digits were in my uh, measured quantity. My conversion factor has an infinite number of significant figures. That isn't always going to be the case. It is for centimeters and inches. That is an outlier. That is a, it's just a weird quirk of nature the way that worked out. So my answer has to have the same number of significant digits. So the same thing as if I, um, you were converting eggs into dozens, whatever, you know, that would have an infinite number of significant digits. But if we had 454 um, grams over a pound, and we were using this to, to change units, well, this only has three significant digits. So we would be limit it to that number of, of significant digits, regardless of how precise my measurement was. Does that clear things up or to make things more confusing? Both. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough, I understand. Thank you. Yeah, there's really, there's, there's very few conversions that are, are exact. Most of them aren't. Um, like this one isn't exact. The, um, the only ones that are exact, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you beforehand, but I mean, it, centimeters to inches is one of the few. And, you know, we're not really going to use that too much. We may use it a little bit for like, you know, cubic inches, and cubic centimeters and all that kind of stuff, but not too much. So we sort of with this through this a little bit um, last week too, but there's two different rules when you're doing um, calculations with these sort of numbers. When you're doing multiplication or division, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you take the number that has the lowest number of significant digits, and your answer has to have that many. Basically, it means that you're limited by the precision of your lowest pre precision number. So the least precision of any of these measurements is this one for the first 
So I could measure the first two super accurately. But then when I multiply that by something that isn't that precise, well, then my final answer is going to be that precise either. And the same thing with, with, with dividing. If I'm dividing something with five significant division uh, numbers, digits, I'm dividing that by something with three, my final answer is only going to have three as well. So multiplying or dividing, you're always limited by the least precise uh, number, okay? Now that's going to be slightly different when we're dealing, oops, what happened there? I have a quick question. Oh, sure. On the 0 0.53, if it were to mm -hmm. be 20.53, we'd have four significant figures, right? That's right, exactly okay. right. And so then, then our final answer would have four significant digits. That's right. Mm -hmm. But when you're doing addition and subtraction, instead of just looking at how many significant digits there are, we look at how many digits past the decimal there are. That's going to be um, the important thing. So here, even if we have some, some um, number that's not terribly um, precise, that won't um, affect the overall precision of that number if that number is really, really, really small. So if I, if I subtract a really, 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 really small, uh, not terribly precise number from a large precise number, I'm still gonna have a lot of precision left over. So I'm not gonna waste that. So here, this is a good uh, method to use. Just go down and see where the numbers are past the decimal and just draw a line right down there. So that tells you immediately that every number I've got here has at least two digits past the decimal point. So my answer is gonna have two numbers past the decimal point. And so here I've got four significant digits. Here I've only got one, and here I've got five. But my answer has three. Why? Well, because this number is so much smaller than the other two, basically its lack of precision doesn't really affect the overall uh, number as much. It basically only affects the digits that are even smaller than it. So this five in, in 2.345 is even smaller than this 0.07. This um, seven five in 2.9975 is also smaller than my 0.07. So those are the only parts of those numbers that are affected, the rest of them aren't. So we just look and see um, how many digits passed uh, the decimal. So same with addition, same um, with subtraction. So again, here, we've got a relatively large number and we're subtracting a relatively small number. So because the larger number is not as um, precise as the smaller number, our answer isn't gonna be that precise either. So it is limited by the larger number. So think of it that way. The, the larger numbers sort of will define how precise our answer is when we're doing addition and subtraction. When we're doing multiplication, um, it matter, all the digits matter because when we're multiplying by something, basically we're changing everything about that number. When we're adding or subtracting, we may be adding only a little bit or subtracting only a little bit from another number. And so it doesn't really affect the precision that much. I have a question. Yep. Oh, when we round, yes, excellent. Now, see, we've rounded, we've, both of these have rounded answers. So this, I have 5.4125, but I can only use two digits past the decimal. So I can only use these three. So then I look and see what's the next number. The next number is a two that's smaller than five. And so I, I leave it. Now, on the other hand, I, here I have 5.679. I can only use the 5.6. I can only use these two numbers. Same way, I look and see what's to the right of that number. Oh, it's a seven. That's bigger than a four. That's five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I increase this to 5.7.
because this round 5.7 rounded is actually closer to the real answer than 5.6, right? That's why we, that's why we round up because 5.7 is actually more accurate than 5.6. So yeah, we always when we when we come to um, giving an answer, we figured first we figure out how many significant digits we're supposed to use, and then we round. And we only round. This is actually a really good question because I want to bring this um, to bring this point really hammer at home. It's super important. You do not round any numbers until you get to the end, because basically when you round, so let's see. I don't want to round any of these numbers until I get to the end of my calculation. Because if I round them too early, I'm losing precision. I'm throwing precision away. And I want to keep that uh, precision. So and the same is true and when you're doing um, multiplication and division. If you're given a whole series of numbers, don't round any of them until you've finished all your, all your calculations and then figure out um, how many significant digits and then do your rounding. Okay, that's really, really critical. So yeah, great question. So I have one more quick question on okay. that. Mm -hmm. um, when we're looking at that uh, 5.4125 and we round, you know, we, we leave it at the, the 0.41, mm -hmm. when you round, would you round the five? Would you start all the way over at the right-hand side? So you're nope. gonna, no. Just, just the next number. Beautiful. Thank you. Just the next number. Yeah. Great question. Just the next number. And the, yeah, because um, if that were the case, you, you you would you would like if I had a really long, like let's say at four point nine eight two five seven six, and I had to round to three digits. Well, if I started here, you know, it's let's say this was a four, then I would round this to an eight. I would round this to a six. I would then round that to a five. And then I would round this to a nine. Well, I shouldn't have done that because four, five, seven, six is actually, that's less than half of that number. And so I shouldn't have rounded up. It's less than half. And that's the whole point. You, you, we round when it's five or greater, meaning it's more than half. If it's four or less, it means it's less than half. And so by doing the rounding all the way through, we've, we've screwed that up. So only look to the, the, the next number. It's actually easier to do, right? Just look at the next number and ignore all the other ones. Yeah. And you guys are full of good questions tonight. This is awesome. All right, so I think I've covered this. Yeah, four or less, round down up if it's uh, five or more. So you can see here, um, if we round this number, that's almost 3.35. It's really, really close. And so if it was 3.35, we would round up, but it's not because 49 out of 100 is in half. It's just less. So we leave it as. 5.3. So ignore all the digits to the right. Just look at that one number because that'll tell you whether or not it's more than half or less than half. That that number all by itself. All right, and then, then this just makes my point again. Um, don't round intermediate steps. So just keep track of significant uh, figures by you can either underline you know, the least significant digit, or you can just, if there's, if there's multiple things to do, like, oops, let me go back. If, yeah, if there's multiple steps, like if there's an addition or subtraction step in brackets, and then um, uh, multiplication, just keep track of how many significant digits there are in this measurement. Just, and just go all the way through. Just um, do in, in your calculator. Just leave all leave all the significant um, digits there, and then just keep track of what how many significant digits are here. We know that's three. We know that's four. How many significant digits were in this answer? 
And so we figured out it's only two. And so then we use that, then we use the two significant digits. Okay. So another, let's just show how that would work. So we have 5.489 and we're subtracting 5.01. So we know that our final answer can only have two digits past the decimal, right? Because that's what we're looking for. How many past the decimal do we have? Just one. So we have zero, four, seven, nine. And then, so if that was gonna be our final answer, we would round this to 0 0.48, but it isn't our final answer. We have more calculations to do. And so since we have more calculations to do, we leave it at 4.79, leave all the significant digits there. Just leave all the digits there, whether or not they're significant, just leave them there. Um, because if you don't, you're basically losing precision in your final answer, okay? So do all your calculations with all the digits, and then at the end, figure out how many you should have. So if this has three, this has four, and this has two, your final answer should have two. So yeah, that's a really, really important uh, thing to remember. All I have right. a question. Sure. For example, my, my answer is 1.0988. Mm -hmm. And then the significant okay. figure should be only three. 1.0988, okay. And so the significant for the final answer should only be three. Mm -hmm. How do I round that up? Well, okay, so this is, so those are the three numbers mm -hmm. you're, gonna, you're gonna be reporting. This mm -hmm. 09 gets rounded up to 1.10. One. That's your final okay. answer. All right, yeah. thank you. So you have to have the zero there. Yeah, good question. You have to have the zero there. So 1.1 1. 1 would not be correct. 1.10 1. 1 is the correct answer. Okay. And so if we were putting that in a scientific notation, it would be 1.10 1. 1 times 10 to the zero. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Fairly silly way of putting it, really. All right, I'm going to skip these because we're going to be dealing with um, sort of running low on time to do our second part. So I just want to get through this and then give you a little break and then we'll, we'll come back for the for working on the problems. So metric system, probably familiar with the, hopefully you're familiar with the metric system. Um, the cool thing about the metric system, it's really easy to do calculations, really easy. It makes calculating super simple because everything's based on 10. So there's no need to, to worry about like how many yards there are in a, in a mile. I think it's like 1,760 or something. Yeah, we don't have any numbers like that in the metric system. Everything's 10, 100, 1,000, or a 10th, 100th, or 1,000th. So it makes calculations much easier to do. So length, meters, time is the same, um, seconds. Amount of uh, chemicals is the mole, and we'll be dealing with that a little bit later. You'll be really tired of hearing about moles. Temperature is either in Kelvin or in Celsius. And um, Kelvin, basically, when we're dealing with gases and Celsius, basically, every other time. And um, interestingly, mass is in kilograms. You would think that the, the unit, the, the, the unit of, of mass would be the gram, but it isn't for some bizarre reason probably because it's difficult to make something that weighs exactly a gram. It was easier to make something that weighed precisely a kilogram um, as a, as a, as a uh, scale that they could, they could use. And so these are the uh, things to remember. So I showed you mega before, 10 to the sixth, a uh, kilo, 10 to the third. Uh, the ones we're gonna be using um, most are kilo for kilograms, uh, centi for centimeters, uh, millimeters as well, and micrometers and nanometers. So those are the ones we're probably going to be using um, the most. Like when we're measuring really small differences, like the wavelength of something, um, we measure those in like micrometers. Micro, this is called a mu. That's a micrometer, 10 to the minus six, or a nanometer, like really, really small um, 
really short uh, wavelengths. Come on. Here we go. So we're going to be doing a lot of converting one factor to another. So as I mentioned, whenever we're changing one factor to another, basically what you're doing is you're multiplying that number by something that equals one, because we're not changing the amount of anything. We're just changing the unit in which we're expressing it. So we don't want to change the amount. Like if I change miles to kilometers or, or kilometers, I don't want to change the distance. I just want to express it differently. So when I multiply my miles by a conversion factor to get the kilometers, what I'm going to be multiplying miles by is something that equals one. So that's a conversion factor. Um, with the unit I want on the, on the, in the numerator on top and the unit I want to get rid of in the denominator on the bottom. But the numerator has to equal the denominator. It has to be equal to one. And all it does is just change one unit to another unit. So these are some, these are some of the equivalents. So again, it's who was asking before, like, you know, when do I use um, uh, significant digits in my, in, in, in your conversion factors? Well, this is where you would use them. So a meter is about 39.36 inches. So if I was, had, 3.06 meters, and I was converting that to inches, I would be able to keep all three significant digits here because I have four significant digits in my, in my, in my conversion. Here, I've only got two. Here, I've got three. Here, I've got three. Here, I've got three. The only time I have an infinite number is the one inch over 2.54 centimeters. That is exact. Everything else is, is approximate. It's about, it's not exactly right. So as I mentioned before, when I wanna do a conversion, what I multiply it by, I wanna put the unit I want on top. And I wanna put the unit I wanna get rid of on the bottom. So if I wanna convert grams to pounds, well, I just multiply that by something that has pounds on the top and grams on the bottom. And so one pound is about 454 grams. So I have three significant digits in that uh, um, um, conversion factor. So whatever number of, whatever, however many um, significant digits I have in my grams, that's how many I'm gonna have in, in my pounds. Um, unless I've only got two significant digits, then I'm only going to have two significant digits there. If I have only one significant digit, like a thousand grams, then my answer is only going to have one significant digit as well. Okay. All right. Again, I'm going to skip that because we're going to do these. So, mass, just the measure of the amount of material. We don't use weight, as you mentioned, because polar gravity is different in different locations. And we have to have, um, when we're doing a chemical reaction, for instance, we're going to be measuring the mass of the chemicals going into that reaction. And if I'm comparing my results with the results of someone like in, in Moscow or something, we have to have exactly or as precisely as close to the same amount as possible. So we can't use weight. We have to use mass. So as long as an object is weighed in roughly the same location, the mass and the weight, when we, when we convert them, should have the same uh, value. Now, volume is a three-dimensional measure of space. So um, solids have volume, liquids have volume, gases have volume. Just how much space does that take up? And so in the lab, we measure with a number of different things. Um, we usually have like a graduated cylinder gives us some, like if we have a large amount of something will tell us how much uh, uh, volume, small volumes, you can use a, you can use a syringe at home when you're, you know, baking or cooking, 
you've got spoons, you've got cups, all these sorts of things. The typical unit that we use in chemistry is the cubic centimeter or in the, in the same in, in the hospital, it's the cubic centimeter. That is also equal to one milliliter or a thousandth of a liter. So one milliliter, that is one small m, capital L, capital L. Um, well, if some people do, do one mil like that, I would prefer if you use the capital L for liter because liter has a capital L in it. Um, that is the same as one cc. That is one of the joys of the, of the, the metric systems. That is the same thing. There is a thousand cubic centimeters in a liter. So there's a thousand mils in a liter. And the other nice thing is that one cubic centimeter or one mil of water, it's exactly one gram. So the density of water is exactly one gram for one mil. So that's that's really easy to remember, right? So one water is one gram per mil. It's kind of nice of how, how that worked out as well. I'm sure when the French invented this, they used that to, to their advantage. Um, are those exact then too, like the- No. No, oh, they're still- well, Which is exact? The the, 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 the- the density of water? The milliliter and cubic centimeter. That is exact. One, okay. Yeah, that like is exact. The, because, the yeah, there is exactly 1,000 milliliters in one liter by yeah. definition. So that's that's exact. And the density one, isn't. Density it's, isn't. No. It's like an estimate again. Okay. No, it's really close to one. <laughs> it's super, super close. I think it's like 1.00. And the density of water depends on the temperature as well. So this is the temperature of 25 degrees, which we'll learn is standard temperature for uh, solids and liquids when we're doing calculations. So it's really close to one. It's not exact. I think it's like 1.00 something. It's close enough to one. But as you increase the, the temperature of uh, water, it expands, right? Get more space between the molecules. And so the density goes down. And when, um, and when you cool water, the molecules come closer together and the density goes slightly up. So it's, it's at 25 where the density is close to one gram. So yeah, it's, it's not exact. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, we, don't, we, we can't use that as, as, a, as an exact thing. So density, probably if you're somewhat familiar with, with density, that is just a ratio of the mass of something to how big it is. Right. So if I have um, something that floats on water, like this piece of wood here, we know that its density must be less than water. And so if the density of water is one, 1.00 1 gram per milliliter or gram per cubic centimeter, same thing, um, we know that this piece of wood must be less. We know also that this piece of metal or whatever that thing is, I'm assuming it's a piece of metal, must be more because it sank in the water. So its density must be greater. So <clears throat> density is one of the things in a substance that doesn't change depending on how much you have of it. If I have a gallon of water or a drop of water or a billion liters of water, the density of all those things is exactly the same. It doesn't matter how much I have. And because of that, we call that an intrinsic property. It's intrinsic. It's an interior property of that thing. So basically, it doesn't change based on how much you have. So that wood, if I cut that into a smaller piece of wood, it's still going to float. If I have a bigger piece of that wood, it's still going to float. It doesn't matter how much of that wood I have, the density is going to be the same. It's going to float. So density is intrinsic. What about mass? Is mass an intrinsic property? No. No. No, no it isn't, right? Because it depends on how much stuff I have. I have twice as much stuff. I got twice as much mass. So that is not an intrinsic property. We call that an extrinsic 
property, X meaning outside, in meaning inside. So that depends on how much you have. What about the volume of something? Is that an intrinsic or extrinsic property? Extrinsic. Extrinsic. That's extrinsic too, right? The more I have of something, the greater volume um, I have. So it is kind of weird that I take one extrinsic property and I divide it by another extrinsic property and I wind up with an intrinsic property. But there you go, because that that ratio of those two is always the same for the same substance. And we can use that oftentimes to identify something. Like if we, each metal, um, each pure metal has a different density. And so if you have a piece of metal, you don't really know what it is. If you measure its density, you can pretty much figure it out. Like aluminum, for instance, is aluminum more or less dense than iron? Less. Less, it's a lot less. Aluminum actually weighs very little. You have a cube of aluminum, you have a cube of iron that's exactly the same size. The iron weighs much, much more. And so you can actually use intrinsic properties to identify things. Again, I'm gonna skip that, go to temperature. So we, we talked about this um, before as well. So I wanna get through this fairly quickly too. Thing I want you to, uh, to know about temperature is that temperature and heat are not the same thing. Not the same as temperature. Heat is energy. Temperature is a measure of how energy is affecting a certain substance. So temperature is the measure of how fast the molecules in something are moving. So my ice water here has a temperature of zero. It's the melting point of water, right? So the molecules of water in here are moving at a particular speed. When I heat it up, when I add more heat energy to it, those molecules start moving faster. And that is reflected in a higher temperature. And then when the molecules move so fast that they sort of break away from each other, the water is now boiling. Um, that is at 100 degrees. And that tells me that the molecules are moving much, much, much faster. And so the temperature is much, much, much higher. But don't confuse, they're not the same thing. Um, heat is an is a, is a, is a energy and temperature is not. Temperature is just a, a, is basically a measure of how that energy is affecting something. And so we're only gonna be using Kelvin and Celsius um, in the lab. We don't use Fahrenheit. So if you, if you saw the slide before, there's only three countries in the world still using Fahrenheit. The United States, Liberia, and Myanmar. That's it. Everybody else has sort of moved into the 19th century. So we don't use Fahrenheit. So don't worry about converting Fahrenheit units because I'm not gonna give you any Fahrenheit units. Um, what you will need to convert back and forth are Celsius and Kelvin. So Celsius was invented by a dude named Celsius. Go figure. Same as Fahrenheit was and same as Kelvin. They're all somebody's name. So um, Fahrenheit was German, Celsius was Swedish, and Kelvin was, a, was from the UK. So Celsius um, is, was sort of the initial... Uh, metric unit, and it was very easily based. What's the freezing point of water? What's the boiling point of water? Freezing point, we're going to call zero. Boiling point, we're going to call 100, and let's put 100 degrees in between. Perfect, right? So 100 water boils, zero water freezes, and we'll put 100 degrees in between. That's pretty easy to understand. Why we need Kelvin is because heat doesn't stop at zero degrees C. Right, lots of things have happened below um, zero. If you've ever been to the Midwest in the winter, you know there it's colder than zero. There we get minus uh, numbers, and so it makes calculations really difficult when you have minus numbers because there's still a temperature, there is still heat energy there. Um, it's not a non-zero amount, and it's not a negative amount. And so when we're trying to calculate the amount of uh, energy in a system based on the temperature, we need to have a non-zero number because at some point, 
there's no more thermal energy. And at what point is that? We have no more thermal energy at all. Absolute zero. That's right, absolute zero. So at absolute zero, everything stops moving. Molecules aren't moving, nothing's moving. And so there is finally zero heat energy in there, none, none at all. And so that is zero. And so that's where that's when we use Kelvin. So Celsius, we use that to sort of, you know, see what the difference is in temperature from something to another. And you'll notice that there's exactly 100 degrees Celsius difference between zero and 100. It's also 100 Kelvins between zero and 100 Celsius. So the size of the degree is exactly the same in Kelvin and in Celsius, exactly the same. So the difference of 37 degrees Celsius is also, and we use this for, for difference, this little triangle, it's also a difference of 37 K. And we don't use degrees for Kelvin. That's another weird thing uh, about Kelvin. We don't use degrees. So there's no negative and there's no degrees. We just say 373 Kelvin or 273 Kelvin. So Kelvin, we're gonna use a lot when we deal with um, gases um, because gases you know, move around a lot. We need to calculate how much energy is going on in, in gases. And so we use, basically we use Kelvin um, to figure that out. But any differences we see, any difference of one temperature to another temperature, it doesn't matter whether it's in Celsius or Kelvin, the difference is gonna be the same, all right? So we'll, we'll deal with that more when we, when we deal with uh, gases in, in, in particular. So again, only thing, only calculation you need to make with um, Kelvin to Celsius is add this number. Add that number. That's it. And uh, don't worry about this because I'm not going to ask you to to change Fahrenheit to anything else. Um, so whenever you so because Kelvin begins at zero, there's no negative numbers. So whatever the number is in Celsius, just add 273.15 to it because that is the temperature in Kelvin at zero degrees C is equal to 273.15 Kelvin. Okay, that's the only that's the only conversion you need to do. So, and remember, all of these you don't have to memorize any of this stuff. All these conversions are in are, are, is is on the canvas. A page. I gave you a, like basically a, um, a a whole list of conversion factors and stuff you can use on on tests. If has everyone been able to find that, yeah, I'll, sh I'll show you where that is at the the second part. Yeah, it's basically like I think like six pages, and it's all this information. Because I don't believe in memorizing things because I can't memorize things anymore. But you know. So this, these, this is the sort of thing, this is the sort of conversion that you don't have to memorize, just be aware of it. Um, if you do have to do that conversion, look at the sheet and you'll see that this, this is the, the conversion between those two temperatures. Okay. So normal body temperature, we all know it is 98.6. Stop thinking about that, it's 37.0. That's the sort of normal body temperature, plus or minus like half a degree is like pretty much what everybody has. Um, anything over 40, we call that hyperthermia and they need to be, you know, cooled down. Generally like, you know, put in some ice and cooled, have their body cooled back down to 37. Hypothermia, then the body temperature drops below 35. So, you know, you feel their skin feels cold and you know breathing slowly so they their body would be like you know wrapped in, in blankets and slowly slowly warm back up you don't want to shock somebody like in a you know hot bath or something slowly bring their temperature back up to 37. now percent everyone should be uh, hopefully familiar with percent we're going to be doing a lot of percent calculations we're doing stuff like mass percent and volume percent and all that sort of so percent is just from the french 
a cent meaning a hundred, per meaning of of a hundred, out of a hundred. So we take whatever the whole thing is something. We have some whatever system we're dealing with. We measure everything in it, and then whatever in part we're interested in, we put that on the top. And we just basically it's parts of a hundred. We've heard of like parts per million, parts per billion, you know, PPM, parts per million, PPB, parts per billion. Percent just basically means parts per hundred. So you just multiply by a hundred this, this conversion here and you give the percent sign. And we'll be doing that a lot. We, uh, as I said, lots and lots of calculations involve percent. And then, yeah, so these are some of the, we, we're gonna be using um, SI or System International metric system. Um, but a lot, in the US, it's really confusing because you're gonna be seeing um, US systems in, in the uh, hospital sometimes too, which is weird. Like, you know, fluid ounces and, and that sort of thing. Um, so these, these are the uh, conversions for the, I don't know, I should probably add these to our um, conversion table because you're gonna be seeing these a lot. Maybe not like, uh, we may be seeing fluid ounces to milliliters, uh, pounds to kilograms. It's interesting, you still like, you know, patients will still, their, their um, uh, weight will still be given in pounds, but then their blood pressure will be given in millimeters of mercury. So, a lot of times you have both um, units, uh, different, completely um, different um, systems on the same chart. It's really weird, but what are you gonna do? I think it's like in Canada, I think we, we still use pounds um, for most things. I think not many people know how many kilometers, how many kilograms they, they are. Right, so when you're writing lab reports, um, most, like I said, most of the units are metric, but not all. Um, the, like I said, body weight is usually measured in pounds, but then when you're giving drugs, they're usually measured in something like, you know, milligrams per kilogram, right? Or um, millimoles. We'll talk more about moles. Moles is basically an equivalent of, a, of, a, of an amount. It's like how, how much of something. That is a chemical amount. Um, a mole of one um, chemical reacts with a mole of another chemical. They will have different masses, but chemically, those are the amounts that react with each other. So we use moles all the time, super, super um, important. It counts the number of, of particles in matter, and it gives like sort of like the chemical equivalent like one millimole is a thousandth of a mole. And electrolytes, we're dealing a little bit with electrolytes. Electrolytes are ions, right? Can anyone give me a, an example of a common ion? Sodium. Mm -hmm. How do we write that down, sodium ion? Sodium is Na, but if it's when it's an okay. ion, what do we... And have a negative sign, a super, uh, it put a negative sign on the top, correct? Positive sign. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> We're going to learn that, boy. Yeah, so sodium chloride, like salt, we throw that in the water. We get negative chloride ions and positive sodium ions. And we measure uh, the amount of ions in equivalents, which is the same as a mole. Like a, a mole of an ion, we call that an equivalent. So that would be a milli equivalent. Um, we'll, we'll deal more with, with ions in, in, in the next chapter when we start looking at the periodic table. Metals become positive ions, non-metals generally become negative ions. So calculating dosages. Always important to know what's the unit you need for the final answer. Generally, the dosage of something is either gonna be something like milligrams if it's a pill or something like that, or it's going to be in milliliters if it's in a solution. So determine the conversion factors you're gonna need. 
to cancel those, those units out. And then set up the equation so that all units cancel except the one you want at the end. So if you're if you're trying to figure out um, like the, the dose of something in solution, basically you want to you're going to want to cancel everything until you get to milliliters or cubic centimeters, which is the same thing. Remember. Um, so how do we do that? Let's let's we'll do this one and then we'll take a break. Oh. All right, so we have a 38 pound child is prescribed a cyclovir. A cyclovir is an antiviral uh, drug that causes that prevents the virus from replicating. And it's got because they have chicken pox. Um, so the amount that's supposed to be given is 80 milligrams per kilogram of body weight every day in four doses. Now, each tablet has 700 milligrams of medicine, okay? So how many tablets do we give per day? So let's figure out what do we need to do? So we need to, at the end of the day, we need to figure out how many tablets. So we need to have tablets at the end. All right, so we write down basically all the information we have. So we have 38 pounds. And so we're gonna figure out what's our dose is 80 milligrams per kilogram. But we don't have pounds. So what's the very first thing we need to change? Convert the change weight. pounds to kilograms, yeah. Yeah, we need to do that. So I'm gonna multiply that by something that has kilograms on the top and pounds on the bottom. So what's my conversion there? I think it's approximately it's like 2.2, right? 2.205, something like that. Let's just say it's 2.2. Maybe we've got only two significant digits there anyway. So 2.2. Oh, wait a minute, other way around. 2.2 pounds per kilogram. Oops. See how easy it is? I almost made the same mistake that I tell students never to make. That's why I always multiply and never divide, because if, when I multiply, I can see what I'm doing. Right, so pounds go away, and I'm left with kilograms. So how many kilograms is that? Someone's got to have a calculator. 83.6. I'm sorry? That, we have 2.2. Mm-hmm. Multiplied? No. What are we doing here? It's going to be 17.27. We're dividing, right? We, mm -hmm. So we, we take 38, we multiply it by 1, nice. and then we divide it by 2.2. Right. So we have 17.27. And I, remember, I'm going to, I don't care that I have more significant digits than I need right here. I'm just going to leave them. But I don't care about that till I get to the end. So I have 17.27 kilograms. So the next thing I have to do is figure out what the dose is. So I know that it's 80 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So I've got my, let me erase this. I've got my 17.27 kilograms of body mass. Now I'm gonna do another conversion. It's 80 milligrams for every kilogram. So how many milligrams is that? One thousand three hundred and eighty-one point six. Man, you're all over it. Thirteen hundred and eighty-one point six milligrams. So that's how many um, milligrams of a cyclovir should be given um, each day, because that is the that is the dose 
per day. And now it should be divided into four doses, right? So next is to figure out how many tablets is that? So I take my milligrams, which is 1381. Clear that. So I have 1381 milligrams. Oh, wait, wait so, oh, sorry, 0. 0.6. And I want to convert that to tablets. So one tab is 700 milligrams. So I see the answer is going to be approximately two, right? So 1381.6 divided by 700, 1.974 tablets, which is really close to two. So we'll, now we can round that. We can round that to two. So two tablets a day. But we're supposed to have four doses, right? So what's so we know the first answer is how many tablets do we given per day? We know that that is two. How many per dose? Three forty-five point four. You divide the one thousand three hundred eighty-one point six by four doses. Um, yes, that tells you how many milligrams, but we're dealing with tablets now. How many tablets should be given per day? So we've established that it's two. Two tablets, yeah. Two tablets per day. How many per dose if there's four doses each day? Half a tablet. Half a there you go, half. Right, so we would take our two tabs times uh, one over four doses, and then we get how many tabs per dose, two or four or one over two, so one half. Excellent. All right. Let me have a look and see what we've got left here. Um, I don't think we have too much left in the chapter. Um, drop factors, that's just, just another conversion um, for IV delivery of, of, of medications. So drops per milliliter, that's, that's abbreviated in guts per mil. So it depends on if you have a large IV, small IV, it depends on the density of whatever the IV bag is, but they're generally gonna be pretty close uh, to water. Um, so that's just, that's just simply an, another, another conversion that we're probably not going to use too much in class, but that you may come across um, in the lab or the hospital. So just, just be aware this is another um, conversion unit. And then... Um, percentages. I said we're going to get, we're going to be dealing with percentages a lot. So um, percent active ingredient, you're gonna be seeing that a lot um, because active ingredients, um, we can't give pills that are like, like you know, a, a, a milligram because they, they'd be, be too difficult to measure, they'd be really too small. So we just put a bunch of, of binders in there. And so we have typically percent active ingredient would be like 1% or you know, sometimes less than, less than, than, than 1%. So like Benadryl, for instance, has a mass one, oops, go back, has half a gram. And if it contains 25 milligrams of active ingredient, all we need to do is convert the mass, convert them both to milligrams. How many milligrams are there in half of in 0.5 grams? Do you remember what, what the conversion of the grams to milligrams? How many gram, how many milligrams were a there? A thousand were? milligrams per gram. A thousand, right. So that means we have 25 milligrams of active ingredient in 500 milligrams of a pill. So to figure out the percent, we just multiply that by a hundred. Oops, so 25, 
25 over 500, that is just 5%. 0 0.05, multiply that by 100, 5%, right. And how many significant digits in that 5%? Dose. One, one, one. Wait. No, two. two. Oh, yeah. Two, two, two. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry I, I, didn't see, I didn't see the zero behind the. I five. love how you come out swigging, Dylan. I love that. Yeah. So we have two significant digits here, and we have two significant digits here. So it's 5% would be wrong, actually. It's 5.0%. You can see I, I made a mistake, which I'm going to do a lot. Okay. And again, I'm going to skip these because we're going to go. I took way too much time with that. So, so I'm going to give everyone like five minutes if you can get the, oh, I need to put, I'll put the link to the, the worksheet in there. And then, I don't know, give everyone till like 930 um, to work on it. Because, yeah, I don't, I don't want to keep everyone till 10. Ugh. So, but I'll 